Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer with the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County, which is part of the great uh, Library of Congress Oral History Project. And uh, we have the honor and the pleasure of interviewing an old friend of mine, John Wilbur, here this morning from Cincinnati. And uh, Dennis Daly, our historian from the great uh, Library of Cincinnati, is on the video graph here. And uh, we're very, very happy to have you here. John, uh, you and I have known each other uh, for several years through the wonderful program out of Dater High School, which right. you started many years ago and which has become one of the uh, absolute top uh, veteran recognition memorial programs, I think, of the country. Uh, I don't, I'm, there might be some others around, but I don't think there's, <laughs> there's one any better and you've been responsible for that. But what we're gonna do here this morning, we're talking about you. And that's the important thing because your family will have this DVD and they'll be so, so pleased. And, uh, and your daughter is here this morning. We welcome her and it's just great. I was talking with her just a couple of minutes ago and remembering uh, meeting one of your sons, Navy uh, submariner who spoke at the data program several years ago. Anyway, uh, where were you born, John? Here in Cincinnati, December the 9th, 1923. 1923. Just my, had a birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. My goodness sakes, that's, that's just great. Well, um, where, where did you, uh, well, tell me about your family. Did you have brothers and sisters? I got one brother older mm -hmm. and four sisters, one younger sister. We were all born at home. All right. Uh, I just did a uh, <laughs> talk out at uh, Oak Hills for a friend of mine who's a professor up at uh, Xavier University to talk about the Depression years. Oh, yes. This was right prior to World War II, you know. Of course. And it certainly brought to my mind a lot of things that uh, we've stored in the back of our mind, just like we're going to do here with yes. World War II, you know. That's right. Unless you really give it a lot of serious thought, uh, uh, you, you kind of forget a lot of the incidentals. Yeah, that's true. And, and as you point out, <clears throat> Those days were so different from anything that people are experiencing today, you know. A different attitude, a different uh, uh, national philosophy, whatever you want to say. Exactly. Uh, so you had a nice, uh, nice sized family there. Where did you uh, start school? I went to Fairview School, right up there on Warner Street. Oh, yes. And that was a situation, that's one of the things I brought out on my talk about the Depression years. No school buses in those days. Right. We walked up Ravine Street, and Boy, at, at yeah. lunchtime, we walked back down, and then walked back up again to school. That's where we got our exercise. Well, of course. And uh, that's the only school that I graduated from. Uh -huh. I graduated from the eighth grade, uh, went on to Hughes High School, and... Uh, Hughes High was, was the big school in those right. days, wasn't it? Well, Western Hills on the west side, yeah. Hughes High School, and Withrow, of course, and Walnut sure. Hills, you know. But uh, those were great rivalries in sports. But uh, on my 16th birthday, I, and, and I said nothing to my folks, and I don't know if I decided on my way going to school that day, I went into the <laughs> principal's office and told him I'd like to withdraw, and he said, for what reason? And um, my dad had a grocery business, and he had a hard time keeping help. A lot of the fellows were going into service. Of course, the draft started, I think, what, late 39, 40, right. for one year. Yeah, 1940. And so a lot of the fellows from the neighborhood that uh, worked for my dad went in the military, or they went in the defense industry. So yes. he was hard up for help. Yes. But thank goodness, uh, I had three older sisters and a brother, and we ran the store with my dad. How about that? And. Uh, so uh, I, again, out of the clear blue on my 18th, on December the 7th it was, 1942, uh, I just wanted to get some information about the Marine Corps. In fact, I talked to the recruiter and his comment was, where the hell was you last year when we needed you? Like, <laughs> like the war was over, you know? Right. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he gave me a bunch of information. He said, I ain't got no time to sell, you, sell the Marine Corps to you. He said, if you're interested in joining, he said, we got a train going to San Diego. And he said, that is very rare because everybody east of the Mississippi goes through uh, Paris Island. Sure. 
And he says, right now they're filled up. And he said, we got a train leaving uh, in two days. So if you can get these papers back to me and pass your physical, if you've never been to California, you'll be there now. Oh boy, now wait a minute. You were 16? No, 18. You were 18, 18. by that time. Okay, yes, okay. It was on my 18th birthday. Right, now, uh, you know, we all have great moments in life and, and dates that we'll never forget where we were when something great happened. Where were you on December the 7th, 1941? Well, we usually, uh, the, the fellows in the neighborhood, there was a pool room down on Central Avenue, and we would congregate there, meet up, and then go to a movie. Okay. But uh, he always had the radio on, and of course, when, when that those bulletins came over, everybody just left, one, at, one by themselves, and just went home and, okay. and was with their parents because it was something, uh, you know, the war was brewing over in Europe and there was always this trouble with the Japanese. They were lying to us up in Washington, you know. Absolutely. And uh, so everybody just went on home and stayed with their families and, uh, and kept tuned to the radio. That's you know? right. Yeah. That's right. It was a very, uh, a very emotional time. And uh, as you pointed out, we'd, uh, we'd, and that was still in the Depression, depression area, we, oh, yeah. era, we hadn't come out. And uh, so that was a, a very forming, a life-forming experience. And you're working with your father and your family in the grocery business. Exactly. What, what, a, what great experience for a youngster. Um, so two days to get on the train to go to San Diego. Right, I, uh, wow. my brother-in-law, <laughs> got to, a, there was a notary public living in the neighborhood and we filled out the application <laughs> and he notarized it and I took it down and, uh, on the uh, 8th of December and uh, took my physical down there and they passed a physical and he says, be here tomorrow morning at X number of hours. And uh, there was probably a group of about uh, 35 or 40 of us. And the uh, fellow put in charge, he was uh, he had one or two years of college from up in Dayton, Ohio. He was given the responsibility with a roster sheet. He said, make sure these guys all get to the Marine base in San Diego or we'll be looking for you. <laughs> and uh, that was my first train ride. Never was on a train before. Oh, uh, it took uh, five days and four nights because we made a lot of stops. We, uh, it was a troop train. and. It was carrying a lot of soldiers and sailors and dropping them off, picking them up. But one thing I, I always remember, what, regardless of what hour of the night or early in the morning, if this train would stop to take on water or fuel or whatever, the people from the neighborhood boarded those trains with hot cups of coffee and oh, chocolate boy. and donuts and sandwiches no, at every stop, yeah. every stop. Yeah. And uh, the government had arrangement with uh, at that time, there was a chain of restaurants called Fred Harvey's. I don't know if oh, they're still sure. in existence. You bet. And that's where we ate our meals. We, sure. we got one full meal, which was a noon <clears throat> meal. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to train the schedule to be there, you know. And of course, when we got to San Diego, we got the uh, usual Bronx cheer that I guess every recruit gets. You'll be sorry. <laughs> yep. You'll be sorry. Head for the hills. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And uh, we thought, well, that was so much BS. You yeah, know? right. And, uh, <laughs> so there we are in our civilian clothes. And uh, well, uh, the boots in, in San Diego, uh, I went through Navy boots at, at the old destroyer base there in 1942. And that was a uh, that was an incredible experience, boot camp. Well, it was, but I didn't find it all that hard. No. Because I'll tell you why, because of the fact that uh, for two years I worked in the store. And sure. there was no number of hours that we worked. We worked until it got done. Sometimes yep. after the store was closed, we'd go back. So we were used to physical work. That's right. And uh, so many of these fellows that uh, were college students or high school students that came in, they had a hard time coping yes. with it. Yes, they did. That's very true. They really did. And of course, the the discipline and the and the routine and the rigorous uh, demands on on the boots uh, also was a very life forming oh, experience. Oh, absolutely. Now, when you got out of boots, uh, what were you there about three months? Two I, months. I think boot camp at that time was about twelve weeks. About twelve weeks. And yeah. uh, of course, after you have your last review, you know. And, you assemble and they give, you, give out the assignments. 
Uh, one thing I remember one time when we were having a, a, a lecture, uh, the drill instructor says, how many of you guys like to hunt and fish? And boy, everybody's hands went up. <laughs> and for some reason or other, those are the guys that ended up in the infantry. Right. <laughs> and uh, uh, although I, my fellow that lived in our house, he did take me hunting and fishing a couple times. But uh, just fortunately enough, I didn't, when I enlisted, I didn't go in with anybody. But there was just two of us that were picked to go to motor transport school. Mm -hmm. And a fellow that was picked was a fellow by the name of Harold Pond from Cincinnati. And uh, we went through motor transport school. It was about five or six weeks. But he had a very sad experience because <clears throat> one of the problems in, in, or one of the programs in motor transport school was uh, we went on night motor marches. And uh, we went up into the hill country around San Diego and uh, with the windshields down and the dust blowing back at you, you had goggles on. and. Uh, the, th the theory was to find that you had the proper space. This was without headlights. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as you could see the tail light, the tail light was split. As long as you could see four lights back there, you had the proper distance. And uh, what had happened going around the, uh, this mountain, why my friend Harold uh, made a left-hand turn instead of a right-hand oh, turn dear. and went down into a canyon. Oh, and of course, uh, we stopped and uh, and then we continued on back to the base and uh, found out that the next day that he and his, uh, he had a mechanic riding with him, they were both killed. Oh so it was about a day or so later, I was called into the first sergeant's office and uh, was given the order to take his body back to Cincinnati. Ooh. And uh, here I am, 19 years old, and they really put it to me strong. They gave me my official orders and my meals. In other words, uh, from Camp Pendleton to San Diego, they would furnish the transportation. And uh, uh, from San Diego, we got a train to go to Los Angeles. And one of the things he says, anytime you make a change in trains, you get in that baggage car and make certain that that casket gets on the right train. Right. Because there were certain cases where caskets were delivered to funeral homes and it was the wrong person. Oh my gosh. And uh, so, which I did, I told the, <laughs> the, the, the fellow on the train, I gotta get back there when we, well, you know, okay. So we did that and we transferred up in uh, Los Angeles, from Los Angeles to Chicago and did again the same thing in Chicago, went back to the baggage car and made mm -hmm. sure I had his casket to go to Cincinnati. And the funeral director met us at the terminal and uh, he was laid out. Buzzy and Borgman had a funeral home on Freeman Avenue. Yes. And uh, of course they had orders not to open the casket. And uh, Harold always told me, we were real close, went on Liberty together and stuff of this nature, dated two sisters up in uh, LA and he always told me that his dad was always writing him these crazy letters about his girlfriend not being faithful to him and all this and that mm. but his dad wouldn't sign for him to join his mother did and they were separated mm -hmm. and of course when we got to the funeral home there was his girlfriend six, oh. about six months pregnant so oh, what that. he was telling us was true you know yeah. but his dad insisted that the funeral director open the casket he wanted to make sure that was his boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did, he was in a full uniform, but he was totally covered, he was totally bandaged. The only thing that was sticking out was his nose. Oh my and, goodness. Uh, but just a physical description in his what? hair, he could identify that it was him. And he was buried up in uh, Arnheim, Ohio. What an experience for yeah, a young kid you know, like I mean, you was, were just, and, you uh, had a tremendous responsibility. Right, right. And uh, <laughs> they told me I could stay as long as it took to, uh, uh, to be with the burial and mm -hmm. funeral layout. And they wanted a complete report, what, funeral, what uh, funeral home, what cemetery, and what plot, and all this and that. Well. And I had uh, sent a uh, uh, telegram back to the base asking if I could have a couple extra days. And it just so happened that that telegram arrived on a Saturday. And they found out that the, uh, the officer of the day was gone and the sergeant of the day <laughs> took off. Sure. That telegram landed there until Monday morning. Uh -huh. And of course, I didn't get an answer, so I went back to camp and they 
they asked, them, what are you doing back here? You, we gave you an extra week to stay at home, you know. Right. And uh, I understand that the two of them got into a, a bit of trouble for leaving their post, you know, unattended. <laughs> you got... But uh, <laughs> then was... we continued on with our training there. Right. Was... Now, when, when you finished your training, what was your first, uh, what was your first assignment? Where did you go? Well, uh, as a truck driver, they just formed the 4th Marine Division. And we were, uh, fortunately enough, was in a weapons company. We were in the Regimental Weapons Company. And uh, uh, that consisted of three platoons of uh, 37 millimeter anti-tank guns and one platoon of half tracks. Mm. The half tracks was at the uh, uh, discretion of the uh, uh, Regimental Commander where he wanted them. But each platoon was assigned to a battalion. Now, a division uh, consists of uh, three infantry regiments and one artillery regiment and a lot of assorted uh, auxiliary units. And so we were attached to the 2nd Battalion of the 24th Marines. We were in the 2nd Platoon, and we worked with them. Now, and you were a private first class? I, I did make PFC then, yeah. Right. I took the exam for corporal before we left the States and passed it, and, uh, but the, the promotions didn't come through. Our promotions came from the Navy, and the Navy grabbed as many as they can for themselves. Sure. And, uh, and the Marine Corps <laughs> got what was left over. But anyhow, uh, as a truck driver, it didn't call for a corporal uh, rank. But anyhow, um, uh, we, we went through a lot of training. Uh, made landings down there at Oceanside. And then there's an island north of San Diego, San Clemente. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when things were starting to get close for us to go overseas, we had, uh, we boarded ships at San Diego and disembarked, climbed down the rope nets. And uh, myself and the gun commander, we would be the first ones in the landing craft because as they're lowering our gun, they didn't want all our troops there in case the gun was dropped in the same way with the truck. And we had to help the sailors man the um, heavy ropes to keep the, um, either the gun or the truck slamming into the side of right. the boat. So once we uh, got the gun in the truck, in, in the landing craft, and the gun crew came down, and uh, the procedure was that we would circle, and uh, they would have a, uh, small craft between uh, where we were circling and the beach, even at San Clemente. And we had a certain flag, and when that flag dropped, that meant that uh, the people on the beach wanted our guns in there, and then we went ashore. So during these maneuvers, we had, uh, the Navy was bombarding the island, they had targets set up on the island, and the Navy planes came in and they were doing their strafing and bombing runs. It was as about as, uh, actual as being in combat. But the, the real purpose was to make certain that we knew how to disembark and get ashore and to be able to withstand all that noise and, and carrying on. Sure. And once we got on the beach, well, of course the infantry was there and we moved out with them. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, why uh, we did everything in reverse, got back on the landing craft, back aboard the boat. and. Uh, that, that's that's quite an experience climbing down one of those oh, rope boy. nets <laughs> from a boat because you, your, your your transport is going up and down and your landing craft. So when you get to the bottom rung, you have to time it that you step right off into the yeah. landing craft. Yeah. A lot of guys, uh, if uh, they they miscalculated, they ended up in the ocean. They yep. were fished out, you know. Yeah, right. And right. so we had a couple, two, three of those, and then. Uh, liberties were handed out. They said there would be just one group of men. We had a two-week period, I guess the two weeks before we were going to ship out. Mm -hmm. And so everybody put their name in, in a hat, a helmet, and they drew names out. And I've been blessed in so many ways. My <laughs> name was the first name pulled out. You're talking about uh, about 45 men in a platoon. And my name was the first one pulled out, and my closest buddy was the second name pulled oh, out. Oh, for heaven's sake. Now, we're in California. We got two weeks. <laughs> 3,000 miles away from home. It takes five days. <laughs> and so 10 days would be used in transportation. So his good father uh, sent us uh, money for airplane tickets. Oh, And we, we flew out of, uh, 
I think we flew out of Long Beach uh -huh. to Chicago, and of course he went on up to uh, Racine, Wisconsin, and I went on down to, to Cincinnati, but uh, we probably had 12 days furlough, but that was it, because once we got back, everything was crated up and packed up, and uh, Ready it was two days later, why, uh, we were always the first ones to load aboard ship, because they would get our truck and gun, because they would have to go down in the hole, mm -hmm. then the troops would come aboard. So we were on a dock center in San Diego when we were shipping out, and one thing that was kind of startling to me when I seen these piles of white crosses mm -hmm. that went aboard ship. Supplies. So you knew that uh, people were gonna get hurt wherever yeah. we were gonna go. Right, right. So well, uh, when we left San Diego, <clears throat> in fact, we were the first unit in the military that went right from the states into combat. And? Directly. Uh, we, we pulled off of uh, Maui Island, off of Lahaina, and small boats were going back and forth, bringing maps and last minute things. And another incident that happened there, a couple of Marine officers came aboard our ship, and uh, we had a fellow, when, uh, he, when, he joined, when he joined our outfit, why the uh, sergeant asked him where, where his home address was, and he said, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. He said, don't give me that crap, you know. He said, I, I wanna know where your home yeah. is, that's where I live. <laughs> so he took him into the company commander, found out he was Harry Hopkins' son. Oh, for heaven's sake. Harry Hopkins was closer to Roosevelt than anybody. Yes. He did live in the White House. Mm -hmm. So when we were parked out <laughs> off of Maui at Lahaina, they came aboard ship to take him off. His dad sent out orders, you know, he didn't want his boy going into combat. That's just mm -hmm. as simple as it was. Sure. And his answer was, look, he said, I trained with these guys. He applied for OCS. He had a couple years of college, but it was filled up. And uh, he said, I'm not leaving. He says, this is my dad's doings and I'm staying with these boys. And just unfortunately, he was killed on our first operation. Is that so? Yeah. I didn't know that. And uh, Harry Hopkins' son. Oh, Steve. yeah. Harry Hopkins was such a famous yeah. man. Oh, yeah. He was the right-hand counselor of right. FDR. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. now, <clears throat> from Maui, then you went directly, farther west. Directly to Marshall Islands. Okay. We landed, that was a, our first operation was the first week in February. It was Kwajalein Atoll mm -hmm. in the Marshall Islands. Now, Kwajalein Atoll was made up of about 10 or 15 small islands, but the two main islands, uh, and I sent you that map, uh, one was called Roy and one was called Namur, mm -hmm. but the code names was Burlesque and Camouflage. Burlesque was for Roy, and that was because there was absolutely nothing on that island. Oh, see. No vegetation, no nothing. Yeah. And the moor where we <clears throat> landed had all kind of vegetations, and that was really where the uh, Japanese stronghold was. But our main mission was to um, capture the moor for the airfield. In other words, that would relieve some of the pressure on the aircraft carriers if we could have uh, Navy and Marine Corps fighter planes landed there. But uh, the 14th Marines landed first. They landed on some islands down further in the atoll, and they were gonna be our artillery support. Now, that map I sent you, and we had school on that every day. Uh, there was a line drawn right between the middle, between Roy and, and the moor. There was a causeway, and one was marked 23. That was for the 23rd Marines. They took that island, mm. and uh, the moor was marked for the 24th. And uh, we were in support of G and F Company of the 2nd Battalion. We were in the assault waves. Uh, I'd like to back up just a little bit. Back in uh, November, the uh, Navy intelligence made a big mistake on the island of uh, Tarawa. They did all the reconnaissance there when the tide was high. Yeah. And when the Marines landed, the tide was low. And as the small boats went in, they hit this coral reef, which was probably 150, 200 yards from the island, and they couldn't get over that coral reef. So they had to wade in, holding their rifle and their ammunition up in the air, they had to wade in. Now the amphibious tractors were able to negotiate it. So they learned from that, that they did all the reconnaissance on the Marshall Islands, and they found out too, that it had a coral reef completely around the island. 
And what they did, the Navy underwater demolition people, they blasted a hole, uh, uh, not a hole, they took out a whole section of the coral reef. And we actually came in the back way of the island. We came into a lagoon and uh, the Japanese had all their big guns, which they brought down from Hong Kong and Singapore. They had them on the island of Namur, uh, Namur and Roy facing outward. They could duel with our big ships. Yes. Uh, 14 and 16 inch guns they had there. And incidentally, they were all installed by German engineers, not the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were all forcing out that way. Now on that map, there was a line drawn right through the middle of the island called O-1. And our mission was to keep going. Don't stop for anything. Don't stop for a pillbox or whatever. Somebody else would take care of that. Just get up to O-1 and, and dig in and reorganize. And uh, of course, all the streets that were below O-1 started with the letter S, Sakatea, Strawberry, Spruance, and we needed to know that in mm -hmm. case we needed to call for help from our artillery. Of course. But of course, the Navy had taken out all them streets. There was absolutely nothing, nothing. left there. You couldn't distinguish the street. Wiped out. But, uh, and, and uh, uh, all the pillboxes that were down facing the lagoon, all those people were dead there, and they were dead in there probably for a week. Mm. And uh, so the operation lasted about three days. And uh, one of the terrible things that happened, there was a big pillbox, not a pillbox, there was a big blockhouse there. And uh, unbeknownst to our people, uh, it stored aerial torpedoes and submarine uh, torpedoes. And our demolition people blew that up. And they said that was the third largest explosion of World War II in the Pacific, next to the two atomic bombs. Wow. It actually blew a hole in the island. And that's where Hopkins was killed. The majority of the Marines that were killed on the moor were killed from that concussion. That flying so? concrete and... Uh, I'd never known about and, that. Uh, so that's, but by the time we got to the end of the island, uh, most of the Japanese, they were in trenches, but they all had committed suicide. They mm -hmm. were laying on their backs with their rifles and they triggered it with their big toe. Yeah. And they did not surrender. Mm. But one of the dirtiest jobs we had was to go back to the beginning of the island and take those dead bodies out. They were all bloated now. It was, uh, they were in there for maybe about a week and it got so bad, uh, the guys were vomiting in, inside their gas masks. They decided that to, called that off and they just covered them up and yeah. uh, sealed them up and that, that was yeah. the end of that. Mm -hmm. So then we boarded uh, back up on transports and went back to Maui. That's where our base camp was. And that was uh, about the, towards the end of February and uh, got replacements for the people that, we didn't lose many people, but the infantry units lost people, got replacements and really went through a lot of heavy training. and. Uh, we left, uh, we let boarded ship, had a couple of maneuvers there, landings again there on Maui. Then we boarded ship and went over to Pearl Harbor to be formed up with a convoy. And uh, they had a, a disaster that happened over there, seven LSTs. They don't know if it was sabotage or if it was uh, a mistake, but they were all loaded with ammunition and one after another, uh, blew up yes. and uh, so that all had to be replaced so our departure was uh, held up for about a week until they can get some more LSTs in there and load them up with ammunition. Uh, they followed our convoy. Now we went from there to the uh, Marshall Island, uh, uh, to the Marianas. Uh, we didn't know where we were going, that information was put out. We got the map for the Marshall Islands but they, they stopped that because uh, they figured that uh, any event something would happen to a ship and they could find out where that ship was destined, it, it wouldn't help matters. So we didn't know we were going to the Marianas until, uh, uh, well, D-Day in Europe was uh, uh, June the uh, 7th, 7th or the 8th. Sixth, uh, oh, yeah. please. And we landed on Saipan a week later. Uh, we were again in the uh, assault waves, landed on D-Day. We got a call from our 
landing craft to go ashore. And um, now we, you had you had vehicles. Oh yeah, to, yeah. I was to a take truck ashore. Driver. Right, right. Yeah, right. And uh, although once once you uh, hit the beach, that sand means it's hit every so often from the tide. It's just, just as hard as riding on a, a concrete. Right. No problem. So we. Uh, had our gun hooked up and we pulled in, got off the beach. That's one of the things they tell you, get the hell off the beach. Because, uh, and, and we stayed there until we got, we were in a big shell hole. And we was noticing as the infantry and other units were coming in, the Japanese were knocking them out on direct hits and, and couldn't understand it, how they were that accurate. And we noticed poles were, uh, as we were coming in, but we didn't know if the Navy put those poles there for direction, mm. but they weren't, they were aiming stakes. Now, the town we landed, uh, the town we was to secure was called Sharon Kanoa. Saipan was a, um, uh, their main industry was sugarcane, and a sugarcane field is equivalent to our cornfields here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just so happened to be that in the town of Sharon Kanoa was where the refinery was, and there was a big, tall smokestack, and up in the top of that smokestack were Japanese forward observers. Oh my god! And they gosh. were sending the information. There was a big hill or small mountain called Tapacho. They were, and that's where the Japanese had their artillery. Hmm. They were sending the information up to them, and they got direct hits on our ships. Sharpshooters and, and uh, everything. Uh, wow. Then all of a sudden, the Navy realized that that they should have taken that smokestack out. You sure. Know? And which they did, and uh, but anyhow, uh, we got up. We we moved yeah. out uh, the next morning. We stayed there overnight, and there was constant shelling and people, infantry coming in. And we didn't get no call for us to move out until the next day. Were you fired at? Please. Were you under fire? Well, yeah. Personally. Yeah, there, well, I mean, the stuff was going overhead. There was no uh, rifle fire. It was artillery mm -hmm. fire. Right. But uh, no, no rifle fire. We wasn't engaged by the Japanese troops. Uh, but the next day, uh, when we find out where the 2nd Battalion, 24th Marines was, that was our unit to support, why we, our platoon leader contacted their uh, company commander, and we caught out with them. Uh, I remember the, the second night, we were in a, in a in a farm area because there was a lot of guys were I, I remember we ate radishes they, they hit, hit a bunch of radishes we <laughs> our fill of radishes digging them up wiping them off and eating them so it was somebody's little farmhouse and chickens were there and uh, uh, pigs and were running around so we dug in that night and of course the next morning things were pretty well organized um, we jumped off about about 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, when we made sure the infantry was out, out in front, we were all tied in with them. Uh, we would have our breakfast. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think we got, they brought hot coffee up to us that second morning. Hmm. They had a galley set up on a beach. And uh, so we, we moved out with them, and what usually happened was you'd have an artillery barrage, then the infantry move out with tanks in front of them. And, uh, they would have orders to, to go so far, stop, and reorganize. Uh, and I think it was about the uh, third day, uh, we were landing on one side of Saipan, and the second Marine Division was landing on the other side. And it, we were supposed to go straight across the island. Well, in between, they brought in an Army National Guard unit, the 27th uh, Division. They were Na New York National Guards. Now the Marines and the Army trained totally different. Uh, hmm. They both got their good points in their training, but uh, you would think that they would want everything coordinated. And uh, when we got our, t our word to move out in the morning, why the, ar the Army was holding back because they asked for airstrikes and more artillery. And what it amounted to, the two Marine divisions were out front and the Army was back with left our flanks exposed. Mm -hmm. And in going through these uh, cane fields, uh, Japanese were in those cane fields. And then they realized after about the second or third day, to eliminate that, they totally burned out all the cane fields. They oh said all goodness. of them. They had Navy planes come in and drop napalm. Yeah. And that was in advance of where we were going to go the next day. So that all the cane fields were burned out. Hmm. 
And we would continue on till about uh, 4, 4.30, and would make certain that uh, we would tie in uh, with, the, with the infantry units. Our guns were set up right on the front lines. Uh, we carried three different kinds of ammunition. Uh, one was HE, which was high explosive. One was AP. A high explosive would be used against pillboxes and uh, bunkers. And AP was armor piercing, which would be used against Japanese tanks. Now, the Japanese tanks, they didn't use their tanks like the Germans did. The Japanese used their tanks they would have two or three different firing positions, and they would move from one to another. They would not be out in front with their infantry like the Germans would. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other uh, bit of ammunition we had was called canister, and that was the most effective uh, setting up at nighttime with the infantry, uh, because that was like a buckshot. The, two, the, the shell exploded in the tube and set out hundreds of pellets. Right. And uh, when we set up at nighttime, and then uh, at that time, galleys were functioning. They brought, up a, brought us up a hot meal. Um, in front of each unit, I'd say probably maybe 200 yards apart and maybe about 150, 200 yards from the front line, we had listening posts. We had uh, three Marines out there. That was all done by the infantry with telephones. And uh, so they could tell when the Japanese who were out in front of us if they were getting assembling and getting ready to stage a bonsai attack. And what happened, a lot of the Japanese officers would get their soldiers all, we said, sackied up. Mm -hmm. Get them all loaded up with booze and wine sure. and then lead them into this bonsai attack. Literally hundreds of them coming. And of course, we knew they were coming. So our mortars that were behind us, they fired mm. up flares. We lit up the whole area. It was just as bright as could be. And we could see them coming, and everybody just opened up on them. But there was literally hundreds of them coming at a, a designated area. And with our canister shot, uh, it really got a lot of them. Ooh, took them but up. still in all, some of them got through the lines, and behind our lines were our tanks and our trucks. And, uh, but uh, nothing really happened to them. But that's, that was the standard operating procedure, that every night you would go so far get all your lines tied up, have your listening posts out, if possible, bring a warm meal up for the troops. Right. And uh, that went on totally across the whole island. But uh, there was a, a lot of problems between the Army Command and the Marine Command, and the overall commander was a, a three-star Marine general, and he ended up firing the uh, Army general after a number of rhubarbs <laughs> and them lacking behind, and which caused a big furor because that brought out the Army four-star general from Pearl Harbor, sure. and there was nothing but trouble ever since. No. And that was the last time, with the exception of Okinawa, that Marines and Army ever operated together, yes. which just because of difference in training. Yes, right. And then uh, after the island was secured, of course, when we got to the back of the island, the Japanese had these people uh, the, the, the people that lived on Saipan were called Shamarans, and they worked uh, for the Japanese, but they had them people so brainwashed that we were gonna murder all of them and uh, mm -hmm. kill their babies. And so when we got to the end of the island, a lot of the um, civilians jumped off and threw their babies and children off the end of the island down to the beach, which was nothing but rocks, and there were literally thousands of them that jumped yes. off. And uh, we had trucks with loudspeakers pleading with them and speaking to them in Spanish or Japanese, uh, you know, that we weren't, we weren't there to hurt anybody, no, you know. No, you were trying to convince them and, you were uh, <laughs> to save that, themselves. Yeah, that's, that's how it happened. And oh, goodness. Of course, uh, during, during the operation of Saipan, uh, one of the jobs as a truck driver, uh, we would have to take wounded back at nighttime to the aid station and in turn bring supplies back up, water, ammunition, and, uh, and rations. And uh, we found out that the Japanese, as slick as they were, one night uh, they ambushed uh, two or three of our trucks going back. They were dressed in marine uniforms mm. and they were working on a road with picks and shovels like they were fixing 
uh, wire lines. Right. And once a truck stopped, they jumped on the trucks and uh, killed the Marines and uh, oh, took, stole the trucks. So then the word was out that uh, there, there, there would be no working parties. It would be okay to go back. They had right. run a Jeep in front of us to make sure that, uh, oh. but those are some of the things that did happen, you know, on Saipan. Now that was, that was June and July of that uh, was, 44, uh, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that was June. We landed June the 15th. That took about uh, two and a half weeks to secure Saipan. And then uh, uh, we cleaned up our gear, got it in shape, got replacements that came in. And then uh, we went over to Tinian. Uh, Tinian was probably no more than uh, maybe two miles from Saipan. And what they did, there was only one beach on Tinian. It was a, a Tinian town, it was a sizable beach. They took the 2nd Marine Division uh, aboard ships and they bombarded Tinian town, the Navy did. And the Marines got in the landing craft and went in the circles. Well, while we, in the 4th Marine Division, there was a, a, an area on the backside of Tinian that was about as wide enough for two uh, landing craft or two amphibious tractors. Hmm. And we landed there, uh, come in, coming in the back door. The whole division was on Tinian Island before the Japanese realized it. Really? They were concentrating on Tinian Town. Sure. And uh, so it, it was a case of, uh, we moved right across the Tinian. I think that operation lasted about 10 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, once, that, once that was secured, by the platoon leader, I was one of them that got a tag put around his neck. Uh, they had something what they called dinghy fever. It wasn't malaria, but you had dysentery and stuff of that, and uh, eating out of your mess gear, if you didn't clean your mess gear uh, good enough, uh, uh, you, you could get that infection. So there was about two or three from our platoon that was sent to the airfield there on Tinian, and I got envisions of going back to Hawaii or maybe, maybe <laughs> even to the States, you know. But instead, we got on, we got on a C-54, went up and came right down on Saipan. Oh, about that. Was in a, uh, in a hospital for about two weeks, <laughs> 10 days, and got some decent food, and got some medication, and got back to our unit. That was, that was a kind of a debilitating Fever, wasn't it? I mean, yes, it yeah, you ran a fever your and you, energy and everything, yeah, and you had dysentery and uh, oh my you know, gosh, uh, terrible. But, uh, <laughs> they wanted to know who in the platoon was was that way, and myself and two other guys. But I guess they had a plane load going back to Tinian. But uh, we you thought we were, going, we thought we were going to Hawaii or the states. <laughs> but uh, then after uh, after the Tinian was secured, of course. Then they would bring in what they call defense battalions to take over the island, set mm -hmm. up anti-aircraft guns, and the airfields were in good shape. Uh, the Navy brought their planes in, and they operated out of Saipan. One thing before any operation was undertaken, we made certain that we had air superiority. Yes. That our carriers, exactly. uh, and that's where they, probably they called it the uh, Mariana's turkey shoot. Right. Uh, when the uh, uh, Japanese sent their uh, their aircraft carriers and their big ships to, uh, and even uh, Japanese infantry to retake Saipan. Uh, but uh, our, our our Navy pilots and our Marine pilots were so superior to the Japanese. Now, the the Japanese Zero was a very good plane, but they just they just blew them out of oh, the sky yes, yes. and sank a couple of carriers. Right. So then we went back to Maui. Uh, we got back there probably around the uh, middle of September. And when you're traveling in a convoy, you don't go in a straight line. You, you zigzag, you, you go this way so far, and then you go that way so far, and you go this way so far. And the purpose of that is in the event there was a Japanese submarine in the area, they couldn't get a bead really on any of the ships. Right. And uh, of course they would always be, the Navy fellows aboard ship would always have training um, shooting at uh, planes. Our, our Navy would send planes up with a long cable with a sleeve on the back. And the, the Navy gunners aboard the ship would shoot at these sleeves. And i tell you, some of the shooting was so terrible. <laughs> uh, uh, they were so close to the plane 
and there was probably maybe two, three hundred yards of cable, you know. Right. But these guys were banging away. But anyhow, <laughs> they never did shoot any planes down. <laughs> but uh, we got back to uh, Maui and got a real good reception by the people there. There were signs all over welcoming and back to Maui. We were called the Maui Marines. And uh, after a couple days, we got back into getting replacements and we got newer equipment. Uh, they did away with our half tracks. Uh, we got a full track vehicle with a heavier gun on it. The thing of it is that uh, between the two wars, the European War and the Pacific War, every, all the good military units, the Army, went to, went to Europe as well as all the first class equipment. Now they found out in Europe the Army Air Force P-38s couldn't compete with the Messerschmitts. So they pulled all the P-38s out and sent them yeah, to the Pacific. Pacific. Now there was another situation that happened that was, uh, and I, I've never ever read it anywhere except uh, in, in service magazines, that uh, before the war in Japan there was a family, they were missionaries. And the father, he had a son, he was a great tennis player, and he learned his son how to play tennis. And there was a Japanese naval officer and his son was a cadet, a naval cadet. And they, they were playing tennis together. And as the years went on, this Navy cadet uh, uh, became a, Navy, a Japanese Navy officer. And he was so engrossed with playing tennis, wherever he went, he got the nickname of Tennis Ball. <laughs> well, as the, war, as the war proceeded, the missionary's son, he ended up in the intelligence department in Hawaii. And we had already broken the Japanese code and they got a message one day that tennis ball was going to leave Rabaul, that was a big, big port in New Guinea, tennis ball was going to leave Rabaul and go down to Guadalcanal and check things out. And he got all excited. He knew that was Yamamoto. Mm -hmm. And Yamamoto was the guy that was, he was the top admiral of the Japanese uh, Navy. He was the guy that was uh, led the attack on Pearl Harbor. Right. So this, this fellow's all excited and he talks to his superior officer and says, I know that is Yamamoto. He says, that, that was his nickname that he got. So the word got back to Guadalcanal, Nimitz went with it, and the word got back to Guadalcanal. They knew when the plane was supposed to leave Rabaul, and we had about, they said about 10 or 15 fighter planes up in the air and sure enough, here comes this big lumbering uh, transport plane with a half a dozen zeros. Boy. And the Navy had orders not to engage the zeros, get that transport. And they got that transport and that's how Yamamoto got killed. That's right, that's what they called the, they called it the eye of the needle. Whatever. Did you ever hear that term? No, no. Yeah, that, that was, it was the eye of the needle. The needle was the, uh, the formation of the Jap planes and the I was the transport, transport. on which Yamamoto was. That's right. Well, that is, that's fascinating. You talk about history, yeah. John. That, that was amazing that you know people that, that knew about these things and yeah. were on the inside. Now, I know that... Well, I didn't know about it. No, I read that. No, I you... Read oh, that okay, history. all right. But you, you knew... Young oh, yeah. You knew Young Hopkins, so oh. that was... Oh, well, yeah, he that, was in our outfit. That, now, um, we're, we're getting close to the end of our tape here, and I'm sorry, we need another hour with you. <laughs> I wish we could do that. Uh, tell us about going to Iwo Jima. Well, Iwo Jima, uh, there was 500 ships in our convoy. Right. 500 ships. I think it stretched out about 175 miles. But we didn't see any of the big ships, the big Navy ships. You never do. They're out in front the battleships and the aircraft carriers. And, but the thing of it is with Iwo Jima, from Saipan and Tinian, they bombed Iwo Jima for 72 consecutive days. Yep. And when our spotter planes went back over to check to see the damage, there was no damage. They had it all repaired. They had the, there was two airfields on Iwo Jima, and that was the purpose of the Iwo Jima invasion, that our B-29s flying out of Saipan and Tinian making that long round trip. A lot of them were shot up, a lot of them ran out of fuel because of weather conditions, and they were ditched. They needed a place for them B-29s to land. In fact, while the operation, while we were on Iwo Jima, the first B-29 landed. 
while the battle was going on. And, uh, uh, but uh, with all that bombardment and uh, the Navy was supposed to shell Iwo Jima for uh, a week, but they cut it down to three days because Okinawa was on the plans. That was April the 1st, that was right. Easter Sunday, was to go to Okinawa. And so we got three days of Navy bombardment. There was a lot of uh, rhubarb about that. But anyhow, in, we went through the same procedure, uh, going down the net, getting into the small boat, bringing our truck down, bringing our gun down. And our other, there was four of four our guns in our, and trucks in our unit. We would circle around, and there was a small boat out in front. They would drop a flag as to when they wanted us to come ashore. But we knew that things were terrible because we were, uh, we were not in the assault, we were not supposed to be in the assault unit. We were getting loudspeaker reports aboard our ship and f right from the beach of Iwo Jima screaming and hollering, get, get off the beach, get off the beach. And in turn, we were taking casualties hmm. on our ship. Now, you don't do that. We had hospital ships, but they, 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 they put these casualties on any boat and got them the hell out of there and got them uh, into a boat. And every one of us were saying the same thing. Boy, I'd give my right arm to be one of those guys, right. you know, that it was all over with because we knew it was a catastrophe. We was given the impression this was gonna be a cakewalk, uh, hmm. three or four days a week at the most. But what had happened, the Japanese general that was in charge Everything was underground. They had 16 miles of tunnels through the whole island. Everything was underground. And they could spy, they watched everything. They had periscopes. And the rule that he had for the, his Japanese troops, let the first five waves come in, let them land, yep. and then open up. And that's exactly what they did from Suribachi on the end of Iwo Jima. And of course they bombarded that. and. There was no Terrible. damage done by all that bombardment because everything was underground. underground. And when you stop to think, we're in our fifth year now in Iraq. I think it's about 52 months, we're starting the fifth year. And we have not, in four plus years, we have not even exceeded uh, 4,000 killed in action. Right. On Iwo Jima, in one month, we lost 7,000 Marines in one month. Yeah. And uh, it was because they couldn't miss anything that they shot at the beach and... Uh, there was no protection for them. No. Nothing no. to we, hide behind. We, we, we were exposed, we were on top and they yep. were underneath. And when we landed, uh, that volcanic ash, it's just like walking in snow, you sank up into your ankles. Right. No vehicles got off the landing craft, they just sank. And uh, what happened, uh, our gun crew had a manhandle uh, our gun, pull it with lanyards and, and push it. And my, myself and my buddy from Wisconsin, Jack Mormon, he and I were carrying a machine gun. I had the, the, the base and he had the gun and we had two cans of ammunition. And we were probably about 50, 75 yards out in front of the guys pulling the gun. Now, right off of the beach on, on Iwo, there was a terrace that went up. And uh, you had to get over that terrace and then further back was another terrace. We don't know if the Japanese, uh, the, if they were man-made or was because of the tide or whatever, but they, they were hard to get over. And uh, so as we're going up, moving out, there's a, there was explosions all over, but there was one horrendous explosion, it was real close by. And he and I jumped into a hole, a shell hole, and he's complaining that he can't see and I try to calm him down and we're trying to find out what's going on and he, he kept complaining. So I, I, I walked him back to the aid station and that's the last I seen him until after the war. And in coming, going down and coming back, what happened was our gun crew rolled over a landmine. Now they had mines about that big and wow. they had four horns on them and to, disengage that mine, all you had to do was screw that horn. That horn was filled with acid. But if you bent one of them, that acid went down. And that, that mine could literally throw a bulldozer or a Sherman tank up in the air. Mm -hmm. So there was absolutely nothing left but pieces of the gun and pieces of the people. Right. Well, I got back to that sh 
I found that shell hole, and it was raining, and it was cold, and it was starting to get dark. And I got in that shell hole and covered myself with a poncho, and believe it or not, I, I slept that whole first night. How about that? I went sound asleep. And the next morning, we had a, with everything still chaotic, and it, it never ended. It went day after day, it was the same thing. Uh, found our unit, and we tried to get organized, uh, but we didn't know where anybody was. Hmm. Uh, and so we, we, we stayed together and tried to make communications. And after about the second or third day, we finally got in contact with the unit that we were supposed to support. And uh, our guns were very effective against their bunkers and their pillboxes. But that island was so set up that if you knocked out one bunker, they had two or three of them around it that another mm -hmm. one would cover it. In other words, it wasn't knocking out a bunker and moving through, uh-uh. And the same way uh, in the mornings when we jumped off after a... You're fine, keep going. Oh. He's just after, giving me a little sign. After a, a, the way they jumped off every morning was with an artillery barrage and the tanks out in front and then the infantry would follow them. But as soon as that happened, they would open up. Oh, wow. And, in other words, if we made 50 yards a day, oh, that was good. It was terrible. And, and w with a lot of losses yeah, in between. Yeah, it was terrible. And uh, it, it was, and it was... Well, it was, it was, it was a, a bungled campaign, as you, as you so clearly pointed out, John, that, that our intelligence uh, was not smart enough to know exactly what it... That everything was uh, underground. Under, everything underground, and those big guns from our naval ships just uh, didn't didn't do the job at all. Now, you pointing ahead, did you get to Okinawa as well? No, 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 no. Uh, when the operation on Iwo was over, why, we were evacuated and they brought in a defense battalion. Uh, I think, they had, we landed 19th of February and the operation went on till the 28th of March. Yes, and, yes uh, it was a terrible, again, terrible I, thing. I never received a wound in all four operations. You were so I mean, lucky. It was, it was all around me and, yeah. uh, uh, Boy, the good Lord was watching over you. I he certainly you. was. My goodness. And in the meantime, why uh, the airfields were put into, uh, the, the CBs were up there. That's how we got our vehicles off the beach. The CBs came in and laid metal um, uh, matting down. Mm -hmm. And, and the, what, the way the CBs and even the marine engineers, the way they would look for landmines is they would be about eight or ten guys across and they would probe with a bayonet into the ground. Right. And when every one of them, that area was cleared, they moved forward. And they had white tape on the end Mark of the line. It. And uh, so when we were driving our vehicles, when we had to take wounded back at nighttime, driving without lights, <laughs> we knew <laughs> we had to stay within those white lines. Yes, But yes. Uh, And that was a volunteer job. The infantry uh, uh, officer in charge would ask if he could have one of our trucks to get his wounded back to the beach and, uh, and uh, we all volunteered and we said as long as we could have two of his men ride on our front fender, ride mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. uh, what do you call that? Anyhow, they had a term for that. Yeah. And that was no problem. So when we d took them back to the aid station, of course they guided us riding through where the taped areas were. and. Uh, when we got back to the aid station, we went over and picked up water and ammunition and rations and brought them up both for that infantry unit that we were supporting and for our own selves. Well, That's John, right. you've just, you have told us all what it was really like to be there. We read about it in magazines and history books and so forth. And uh, I was never on land in any of those operations. I was always on a ship. but. Uh, to be there and, and to live it as you did, and to be as lucky as you were to come out with your hide and, and, and your good uh, mental capacity and everything, and uh, it, it was a tremendous, tremendous thing for you. And we uh, were running out of time, unfortunately, here now, but we thank you so much for this wonderful history lesson. And uh, I know that your family and Whoever will see this DVD 
is going to be very thankful for you, and God bless you. And uh, we appreciate this opportunity, open. really. Well, it's just been wonderful, John, and thank you so because. very much.